Um, well, thank you all so much for um, coming this morning. I think it's going to be a great event. So thank you for getting out of bed uh, reasonably early. I know it can be a bit of a challenge at conference if you've been in the bar um, the night before. So thank you so much for, for coming. Um, we're, we're very uh, happy to have you all here. Um, before we start, just a few things. If you want to uh, tweet about it, about this event, which I'm sure you do, um, <coughs> We, we are using the Twitter hashtag um, CPC21, which is the one for conference. Uh, hashtag bright blue as well is one that you can use. Um, the Twitter handle at we are bright blue and at WSP underscore uh, UK. So that is for tweeting. And of course, you have to tweet about things. Otherwise, people don't know you've done them. And that would be terrible. Um, so uh, first of all, as well, thank you to our hosts, to Bright Blue, um, to WSP. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of the uh, great work that Bright Blue does. I'm a big fan of them. And um, we've got many, many events on here at conference. They are, uh, I think, um, very much leading the narrative in terms of liberal conservati conservatism. Um, they are a wonderful organization. <laughs> so thank you so much to them for having us um, here today. Um, this is all based on a report which I would encourage you to read, Nature Positive, uh, Public Attitudes Towards the Natural Environment. So what we'll be discussing today are some themes that have been uh, raised in that report. It's really primarily about the way um, that the public engages with and values the natural environment, but also who people believe is responsible for protecting it. Um, we'll kind of have a bit of a discussion as well, I think, about government policy in this area, um, how far it goes, uh, could, the, could, could it do more um, in this area? And of course, as well about the um, urban environment and as our urban environments um, continue to expand, how we can bring in uh, the natural environment to those areas so um, many more people can en enjoy it and, um, and have access to it. So they are the themes that we'll be um, looking at today. We have a very uh, distinguished and expert uh, panel, which I will introduce to you um, now, uh, Rebecca Powell, of course, mm -hmm. uh, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State uh, for the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, who actually tells me as well was the first ever in the UK environment correspondent for HTV in the if she on telly um, in the late 1980s. She tells me yeah, so as an experiment, as an experiment <laughs> that I think well. it's certainly <laughs> caught on. I think and um, yeah, ahead of your time on that. Um, on her left, we have um, David uh, Renard, the uh, leader of Swindon Council. He's also the chair of the LGA's Environment, Economy, Housing and Transport Board. Uh, welcome, David. Uh, to the left of him, Tom Butterworth, uh, the technical director for Nature, Capital and Biodiversity for WSP UK. Um, on my uh, right... Sandy. <laughs> Uh, a man that needs no introduction, but I will do it anyway. Uh, Stanley Johnson, it says here, International Ambassador for the Conservative Environment Network. Also, a former Conservative MEP and Vice Chairman of the European Parliament's Committee on the Environment and, and Public Health. And he said to me this morning that he's no idea what he's going to say, um, and he's going to be as surprised as us when he says it, so that's very exciting. Uh, to the right of him, um, Patrick Hall, Senior Research Fellow, uh, at Bright Blue. So um, we all know what we're talking about. Oh, I haven't introduced myself. I am Liz Bates, the political correspondent for Channel 4 News. Um, so if we uh, if we can start, I think, with um, opening statements, that would be great. And I'll go to you, Rebecca. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here to talk about this. Any opportunity to talk about things connected with nature and nature recovery, obviously, I always take. Uh, and it uh, comes with a great time, doesn't it, because the Environment Bill is just about to come back to the House of Commons. We've nearly finished its progress through Parliament, which has been long, uh, but uh, it's, it's all the better for it, which I'm sure as the morning goes on, we'll talk about that a bit. Uh, and I, I suppose that what I wanted to say at the beginning, just to set this in context, and I'm actually really delighted that Bright Blue have done this report on nature. A few years ago, I bet none of you would ever have thought you'd be doing what you might have considered a fiddly little report on nature. <laughs> but to me, and probably other people on this panel, um, it is an absolutely critical issue. And, um, and, and I've been banging on about its value for the whole of my working life, really. And, and the fact that we have to put a value on nature. And that's actually why it was so heartening that the uh, the Treasury commissioned the Das Gupta report, and one of its you know 
the findings that we, we all ought to know anyway, is that 40% of global economy depends on biodiversity. And lo and behold, we've let it sort of crash around us. Uh, and there is, there is a crisis. I'm not even going to think about denying it. Uh, there are some great pockets of good work here and there, lots of wonderful projects that lots of you will have visited, and so have I, who are run by farmers and indeed by NGOs and quite a lot <coughs> of them are funded by DEFRA money for example, through our Green Recovery Challenge Fund. But there's just so much more to do on that groundswell, what I call the groundswell base level of raising up nature. And, um, and uh, there's a bit in the report that it's quite critical of government. It says we're not doing things fast enough, we're not bringing in policy fast enough. Well, I've got to stridently disagree with that. I don't know when they actually published the report, but so much is now in train uh, to do with nature recovery. And one of the things I think that will demonstrate that Boris has listened, uh, maybe um, via myself and Stanley, uh, in my title in the new reshuffle, um, I am also, I am the Nature Recovery Minister. It is that important, okay? <coughs> if we don't get this right by 2030, and I'm sure you all know, we've now set this target to um, restore nature by 2030. That's a massive undertaking. I think it's doable. I wouldn't be doing the job if I didn't. And we've got all these measures in place coming through at pace, actually, now, uh, which is why I slightly disagree with the report, uh, because we've got the groundbreaking environment bill. I mean, there's no other piece of legislation like this anywhere in the world. It's, it's been two years in the making, but I personally think it's stronger for that. It's been hit by coronavirus, and it's been on, off, on, off, as you will know. Uh, but a great <coughs> deal of work has gone on behind the scenes during that time, and it sets targets, so that's why we've, we've set this nature recovery target on in the bill, and we've got a whole series of other targets, which will all interlink, actually, with the recovery of nature, because it's not a standalone thing. I mean, our, our water quality, our air quality, uh, all of these other things link into, basically, uh, the sustainable land uh, and, and nature, and we need that, don't we? We need that for... Um, <coughs> For, for, uh, for, for the other creatures on the planet's sake, but for our sake. I mean, we've all learned about that, haven't we, in, in the pandemic, that how much we value nature. I mean, thank goodness people have finally woken up to it. And so these measures, uh, you know, will help. So we've got the targets. We've then got the, uh, w the local nature recovery strategies will come through the Environment Bill. Every community will have to have a strategy for where their nature's going, how they'll improve it. Uh, our friends in the local uh, authorities will be play a really big part in that biodiversity net gain will put nature in a lot of urban areas actually the report refers to that how do you get people closer to nature I'm sure we can talk about that later and um and we've got the new farm systems the elm system the single the the, the sustainable farming initiative and in those um measures we are really going to the main aim of them is to deliver on the environment so things like soil health water quality are all going to be uh, really important <coughs> in those uh, in those uh, new delivery mechanisms now that we've left the common agricultural policy. And I personally have set up the Talk Stream Task Force, the Storm Sewage Overflows Task Force, the um, all, all of these measures, they're all reporting back and we're starting to work on the things that they're saying. So there's a huge amount going on and actually it's not just down to government, it's also about partnership working. We're realising more and more and more. It's about leveraging funds from other places, it's about uh, industry and business, you know, realising they've got to do their carbon offsetting, their phosphate nitrate neut neutrality, and lots of ways that we can do this will involve projects where we can restore nature, whether it's a wetland or whatever else it is. So you can tell I've got lots to say, um, <coughs> and I'm, I'm going to end there, but what I overall, I think, a more holistic approach to what, approach to what we're doing, and and that's why I'm there in my role. I mean, government is listening, and we've mm. got the measures swinging into operation that need, will, and I'm committed to delivering on this agenda. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Interesting <coughs> that you mentioned the Environment Bill, because I'd like to know, uh, I think, during this uh, discussion, what others um, hope to see in that, and also whether Boris Johnson thinks it's a priority, because, of course, um, he has spoken about the environment uh, many times before, but we hear more and more at the moment about levelling up the red wall, building houses, so I'd be interested to know as well if people in the audience think it is a priority still for the Conservative Party, if it feels like that, and from the panel as well. David? Uh, thank you, Liz, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. 
to invite to WSP and Brightly for hosting uh, the event. Um, as Liz said, I'm here representing the Local Government Association. I chair the board that covers the economy, the environment, housing and transport. So happy to get into that debate later on about <coughs> housing and um, uh, the impact on some of the other activities that we do uh, on the environment. Of course, in the build up to COP26, uh, and in the wake of the concerning IPCC report on climate change, it's critical that we have this debate uh, on how best to secure the natural environment. From determining how long we live and the safety of the air that we breathe to access for exercise and for our mental health, the natural environment is inextricably linked, not only just to our well-being, but also to our survival. So if securing the future of our natural environment is a critical priority for us all, we need to <coughs> have a look at how we're doing. While the government's taken important steps in the right direction, there's a great deal that can be done, and this year has been billed as the make or break time that we have to do it. Glasgow 2021 uh, gives us uh, the forum at which we can accelerate action towards tackling cli the climate. And the Environment Bill presents the opportunity for a major societal change and the legacy of the COVID-19 pandemic lays the foundations for the path to progress. But integral to achieving this progress will be synergy between public, local authorities <coughs> and central government. So firstly turning to the role of local government, net zero can only be achieved with decarbonisation happening in every place across the country. It will therefore be dependent on local leadership not just because of the powers councils possess, but also due to their track record of delivery in t tackling climate change. So what exactly have councils done so far? In 2019-2020, councils collected the equivalent of almost 1.2 <coughs> million double-decker buses of waste and recycling, installed three times as many vehicle charging points as there are car dealerships, and spent on average £125 on environmental services per person. Considering this leadership and the fact that almost two-thirds of councils in England are aiming to be carbon neutral 20 years before the national target, it's clear that local government is already leading from the front. But of course, uh, the public also have a very important role in this. So while councils are doing their utmost, uh, we must engage with the public because they have their role to play. And this point is made by the Committee on Climate Change who will suggest that individual choices and behaviours will determine over 60% of the reductions in our environmentally harming uh, emissions. There are a set of public behavioural changes that we need to see. First, a modal shift in the way that we move around our cities, towns and villages. Surface transport accounts for 23% of UK greenhouse gas emissions and car journeys alone generate nearly 60% of them. <coughs> That means reducing high emission car journeys and transitioning to walking, cycling and using trans public transport. We also need to see leadership from the public when <coughs> it comes to waste reduction or better waste prevention. We know that avoiding waste, a major GHG contributor, is the first place, is the best environmental outcome. This can only be achieved if a total reset in our approach to consumerism takes place with a focus on the circular economy at its core. And of course there's uh, a huge role here for central government. Uh, so in order to support the role of local government and enable the public to change their behaviour, central government must continue to enable our local leaders. <coughs> this means that the government must work with councils and business to establish a national framework for addressing the climate emergency. We must also see government take steps to align the environment bill with the planning bill making sure that planning departments are supported with the skills and resources required, including local access to unspent financial credits from developers. And ultimately, we must see a clear articulation of the national role and local roles in tackling this crisis, as well as an assessment of funding and financial opportunities. So in conclusion, we all have our role to play, <coughs> but to secure our nature's environment future we must see local authorities empowered by central government to facilitate societal change and capitalise on this watershed moment we find ourselves in. The LGA is working on a cross-party basis with the government to ensure that councils have the necessary tools, powers and resources required to deliver greener, cleaner communities 
and we'll continue to work with government and all stakeholders <coughs> seeking this outcome. So once again, thank you for inviting me. I look forward to the debate later. Thank you so much, David. Um, and uh, now over to Stanley, who I see has written some notes, so that's very encouraging. <laughs> Off you go. <laughs> well, yeah, my first note says, congratulate Liz. Oh, great. Um, yeah. I wrote that one, though, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. No, um, actually, I do, I do congratulate Channel 4, because they have you know, taken a really interesting role on, on this whole environment, environment. Actually, I don't always congratulate Channel 4, because about, about six months ago, they, they decided they would run a program called um, Celebrities for Sale, I think it was. And um, you know, they tried to trap people, you know, sort of scam. It wasn't me. And I'm not saying it was you. And they set up a, they said, well, we know Stan is very interested in, Certainly. you know, in pollution control. And so they invented some, <coughs> some NGO, no, 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 some scheme for cleaning up pollution in the, in the Arabian Gulf. And they said, this is a charity and we're going to get our Stanley to front it. And, and we're going to see if we can get him to accept 100,000 pounds or something like that. Well, happily, my agent sussed that out and said, don't on any account answer the phone, because um, otherwise they'll film you answering the phone. Anyway, so what I'm trying to say is wonderful that the good side of Channel 4 um, <laughs> is here today. Now, the other thing is wonderful to see Rebecca in her new role as Nature Recovery Minister. No, this is fantastic. Rebecca is almost my MP. The reason I say that is I always used to be, I've li lived in Somerset since 1951, when we, when we bought a farm down there, we were in Taunton, and Rebecca is the MP for Taunton Dean. I'm not sure what the Dean is, but anyway, she's, she's and we for some reason have, have joined West Summers and Bridgewater. It's wonderful to see a local West Country MP, and I, and I do want to say that in this whole business, the work of members of Parliament, local members of Parliament, is you know incredibly important. You, you may all think members of Parliament don't do much. They do. They do a, a huge amount. And, um, and Rebecca, I want to tell you, has been completely, completely inexhaustible. Now, that said, Rebecca, you can imagine I'm going to just put in a two or three points which I thought about as you were speaking. And um, the first is a query, and you didn't have to answer it now, but I see we've got quite a chunk of time for discussion. You said, and maybe you, uh, you, you said in the bill you have um, a target for restoring nature by 2030. Now, I know in the bill the government is very much hoping to have a target to, um, I think, um, halt the decline of species abundance by 2030, but it was, it was news to me that you've actually got a target for restoring nature by 2030, and if that is so, I want to say how excited I am um, to, to, to know that, and I'm therefore uh, imagining that the, the next reading, which I guess is in, is in the House of Lords when it comes back to the report stage, the government will be making sure that that statement is actually reflected in texts before their lordships, and though then the ping pong will start with the House of Commons. That's just a query I want to put, because I was tremendously excited to hear you phrase it in that in that way, but it might have been a slip of the tongue. Do you see what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to hold you to it if it was a slip of the tongue. Now, a couple of other points. I know I've only got, I've only got a minute or two. Um, for me, in terms of nature protection, one of, the, one of the things I want to know is that there is effective machinery, you know, to make sure what happens what should happen, happens. Now, some of you may know, and <coughs> the reason I know that you, you may know is that, that um, Liz read out that I'd been an MEP and Vice Chairman of the European Parliament Environment Committee. So I was heavily involved in EU environmental policy for a period of about 30 years. And one of the exciting things about the EU, th those far off days, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to re revisit old battles, but one of the exciting things about the EU is you did have machinery to actually make sure that laws were enforced. NGOs could and did write to the Commission and say, the government is not doing what it was meant to do under X or Y Act, and that included, by the way, as far as nature protection is concerned, something called the Habitats Regulation 
which was linked also with the protection of birds regulation, and the two of them made the groundwork for this vast network of nature protection sites in the UK and throughout the whole of Europe, which were called the Natura 2000 sites. Now, what am I talking, what am I getting at? What I'm getting at is if there was serious damage or the threat of serious damage to such sites, at the end of the day, you had a machinery for making sure redress was achieved. And, you know, that machinery began with discussions with local government, with national governments. If you didn't get anywhere, you could ultimately go to the European Court and the European Commission. So I'm, I'm linking this back to the topic matter, which we have people's attitude towards the environment. They want to believe, I believe they want to believe, that yes, if something goes wrong, there is mechanisms, there are mechanisms for putting it right. And that is why the another aspect, which Rebecca um, may want to come to later, is the powers of something called the Office of Environmental Protection, which is also in the bill which is now going forward. Now, I have to tell you um, that there's a certain skepticism among NGOs as to whether the kind of powers the OEP is going to have will effectively duplicate the powers which used to exist when we were members of the EU. So I toss that out, as it were, as a topic for for discussion, because it's absolutely crucial. And I don't want to get too technical here, um, Liz, but anybody who has studied the amendments, which are, which are before the House of Lords, some of which were, as it were, given the nod by governments, and the species abundance issue was one which was given the nod, but one which has not yet been given the nod, and you could say, I am, you know, putting this up because Rebecca is here and I'm here, and she is the Minister for Nature Recovery, so if this isn't a good moment to ask, I don't know what is a good moment. My view is that Amendment 99, which was drafted on a cross-party basis but with Lord Krebs, K-R-E-B-S, as, as it were, the chief signatory, is an amazingly important um, uh, regulation, because it uh, sorry, uh, amendment, because it does deal it does deal with the powers of the um, of the OEP, but perhaps more important, it, it, it is really questioning whether the government um, shouldn't be tightening its own regulations as far as implementation are concerned. And above all, I think it's, it's demonstrating a certain suspicion, perhaps I put it no, 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 no stronger than that, suspicion that there might be tendencies in the government to relax the kind of um, stringent habitat regulation protection, which at the moment we still have, because as you know, when we left the EU, regulations flowed over into UK. But, but those who are of a, a suspicious frame of mind are sort of pretty worried. And uh, we know that the, the Secretary of State for the Environment, Fisheries, Rural Affairs, and I think there are a couple of other things now that he's got in his, in his, in his title. Yeah, we know that he has now set up a group of which in, on which Re Re Rebecca sits, I think, with Richard Bennion and a lawyer and somebody else whose name I can't now remember. Um, there's another really huge, huge challenge there for you, Rebecca, to make sure that the the tendency to, you know, to to say, oh, well, the habitats regulation, they were all right for their time 40 years ago, 30 years ago, but now, of course, we've got a different approach. We don't really need to protect all these sites. Believe you me, the 400 sites which we have in Britain, which are the upshot of the, of the habitat regulation, not 2000, are, as it were, the crown jewels of our nature protection system. And if we don't protect those, um, you know, we are seriously in trouble. Of course, we have AON, AONBs, and we have national parks, and we have SSSIs, but believe me, now, the good news is that one of uh, Rebecca's predecessors as Minister for Environment was Therese Coffey. That's T-H-E, with an acute, uh, then an R, and then a, a grav. It's jolly difficult if you're typing. I can tell you it takes ages <laughs> to write to type Therese, if you, well, the way I do it anyway. Um, you know, we're getting the inserts and the guy and the accents. And I try not to. Anyway, the point I want to make is she, and I just want to put this on record, she wrote and said that, from her point of view, 
all the sites in the Natura 2000 network must be deemed to be now the UK, UK, I say UK deliberately, because we're not just talking England here, the environment building there, maybe, maybe they just be talking England, but we're talking England well, perhaps. But Therese said, the, the, as far as the 400 sites in, the, in nature protection, these are now to be considered the UK contribution to the Council of Europe's Emerald Network. Now, it may be that you, uh, people, there are people in here who have not heard of the Council of Europe's Emerald Network. Well, I want to tell you, now that we have left the EU, the Council of Europe's Emerald Network is going to be a vital tool for making sure that we continue to view UK nature as part of the geophysical entity, which is Europe. You see, I mean, th this bit of the, the Eurasian Peninsula. So my last point here, my last point is to say, and I have written to Rebecca about this about two years ago, and she wrote me a very encouraging reply, which she may now have forgotten. Um, and that was this. When I was in the EU, I also helped draft something called the regulations to set up a European Environment Agency. That agency exists. It does amazingly good work. It does amazingly good reports. It has done some pan-European. When I say pan-European, I mean the 27 countries. They used to be 28. And there's an article in that, in that regulation which says non-member countries of the EU can be members of the European Environment Agency, and Norway is, Liechtenstein is, Iceland is, Turkey is, Switzerland is. And I have been pressing in the sense that you know, if you write a letter, that's pressing. Um, people like Rebecca not to let the Prime Minister forget that we have a chance to, to rejoin the European Environment Agency. And I don't think we're going to lose any political points in terms of Brexit to say, look, we may, left, we may have left the continent of Europe, but there's no way of pretending that the birds, the beasts, the rivers, the plants do not have serious links with um, environmental policy. And as far as pollution is concerned, that's totally obvious. Well, enough of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Um, and I think I'll probably, in a minute, let Rebecca uh, come back on a few of those points. I think I wrote down about six, because uh, that could take a while. But I do want to let you come back on a few of them. Um, but we'll go now to the author of the report, Patrick. Oh, yeah. The breaches. Well done, Patrick. Thank you. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, so in July this year, Bright Blue released our report, Nature Positive, which we did in partnership with WSP. Um, and essentially it was a polling report looking at the UK's public's attitudes towards the natural environment. There is a lot packed into the report, so I won't go through it all today. We asked over 30 <coughs> questions and we have over 400 different data points. So um, I will instead just pick out some interesting key observations in that report, um, which answer some of the questions that the panel is discussing today. Um, so first of all, in terms of the public's engagement with nature, the public widely recognises the benefits that nature brings both to themselves individually but also to wider society. At an individual level, the most widely recognised benefits were enjoying beauty, improved mental well-being and observing wildlife. At a wider societal level, the most recognised benefits were improved air quality, reducing flooding and improving mental health and well-being. I think on that last point too, we've seen in public attitudes trackers not just our own research but also research done by the Wildlife Trusts uh, and by Natural England that the public has greatly valued nature since COVID-19 has taken effect. Um, and there is a much higher appreciation for natural spaces uh, since we have been locked down um, more than once. We also asked who should be responsible for nature's protection and enhancement. So we asked the public um, out of a series of different actors who they thought should have the highest level of responsibility. Majorities of the public said that it should be government agencies, national government, local government and private landowners and farmers. Um, the other actors we asked about were businesses and uh, the a voluntary sector and NGOs, um, but a uh, majority of the public did not believe that they should have very high levels of responsibility for the natural environment. We also asked the public, do you think that these actors are doing enough? Um, and actually only one actor 
scored a majority in that respect, and that was charities in the voluntary sector. For all other actors, less than 33% of the public felt that they were doing enough to protect the environment, and businesses ranked the lowest at 18%. We also asked the public, what behavioural changes do you think you need to make to protect and enhance the natural environment? Uh, and which ones are you already making or are you considering making? Um, so the most important ones were recycling, reducing food waste and buying less and reusing more. We see those same three as the three most common behaviours that the public has adopted uh, to protect the natural environment. We also asked about um, lots of other behavioural changes like uh, active travel, walking and cycling, making dietary changes, reducing consumption of meat and dairy products, putting up nest boxes in your backyard. Um, so we, we, are, we polled a lot. Um, we did see an interesting observation here which was that older people are actually more likely to have made most behavioural changes to protect the natural environment than younger people. The exception to that is active travel uh, and dietary changes in terms of meat and dairy products. Um, so that was an interesting observation. We then asked the public how they would like to see government policy formulated in relation to the natural environment. And we found that the public marginally favours interventionist policy over incentives. So more stick over carrot, essentially. We also saw that the public was prepared to make sacrifices for nature at the expense of other policy areas. Um, so a majority of the public agreed that the UK should not be giving overseas aid if it is harming the natural environment, even if that aid is providing economic opportunities. And again, a majority of the public agreed that the UK should seek to include conservation clauses in future free trade agreements, even if it makes those agreements harder to agree. And lastly, in terms of government policy, um, we polled the public on a range of different leading domestic and international government policies with respect to the natural environment, so a biodiversity net gain, protecting 30% of land by 2030, um, reforming rural payments, establishing a nature recovery network, just to name a few. Uh, and we found that in every single instance there was wide public support for these policies. So I think what you can deduce from that is that conservation policy is politically healthy for the Conservative Party. Um, and just lastly, and I'll touch on this, and perhaps Tom, you might want to explore a bit further, uh, is around nature and local community. So we asked the public, what are the most important features that make up an ideal neighbourhood? The first was low crime. Uh, the second two were um, plenty of green space uh, and clean streets, no litter. Uh, and then when we asked the public on a private level, what types of natural features do you want to see on your own property? Um, those most valued was a private outdoor garden followed by close proximity to public parks or immediate access to a communal garden. And I think that also speaks, again, coming back to that point of COVID about how valuable natural space is to us. And I think we've certainly recognised that in the last few years. But I will stop there and hand back to you, Liz. Thank you. And uh, finally down to Tom. Okay, so there's an awful lot that's coming out here today, isn't there? I just want to reinforce a couple of points to start with. Um, nature is in crisis. Uh, we've lost about 60% of the abundance of all our species since 1970. If we carry on at this rate, that means 95% in terms of the abundance of those species by 2050. So imagine seeing a flock of 20 sparrows in 1970. 2050, you see one. This is not just important because birds are nice to see and, and wildlife is nice. This is important because this fundamentally, our biodiversity, fundamentally underpins our economy. And the point about the Das Gupta review, I think is an important one. Um, we just heard that 40% of uh, uh, global uh, economy is dependent on biodiversity. That's true. If you take nature as a whole, all, all the stuff that's provided, that ranks up to 50% being directly dependent on nature. And then if we talk about indirectly, that's everything. That's everybody. Um, just try having your staff not eat for a little while, and you'll quickly realize, yes, absolutely every part of our economy is embedded in nature. And this is, uh, this is a quote from the Desk Up to Review. The solution starts with understanding and accepting a simple truth. Our economies are embedded in nature. That is a massive change. 
Yeah, w for a long time we've been thinking that's all externalities, we can deal with that later. The World Bank, who were really uh, charging on putting all, all of these things as external 20 years ago, have recently published a report saying the loss of nature, nature presents a significant and system, systemic risk to our economies. This is really, really important. Another way to look at this is in terms of climate change. And uh, the study that we did with Bright Blue found some really interesting uh, results showing where people rank uh, the importance of different issues. And understandably, this was during uh, you know, the height of lockdown, uh, we had COVID and the NHS coming out top with the economy coming third. And then after that, climate change. Nature came in more or less at the same level as education, which was a real shock for me. Nature and climate change have been moving up the agenda for people in terms of the importance year after year after year after year as we lose nature. Just as we're losing it, we're realizing how important it is. And that point that Patrick was making about people recognizing that it's providing health and well-being benefits, flood relief, air quality improvements, that's new. We didn't see that in surveys 10, 20 years ago. Yeah, that awareness that nature is providing all of these benefits by the vast majority of people is something that's new and important. Coming back to climate change, we've got COP26 around the corner. It's becoming increasingly clear that there is no pathway to net zero without restoring nature. In fact, the evidence is very clear. We will undermine our delivery of net zero if we don't restore nature, whether that be our forests, our peat bogs, and so on. These two systems are interlinked. Um, better than that, they are interdependent. We cannot deal with one without the other. And the good news is we've got a, a biodiversity COP or a nature COP coming up next year. It's also been delayed, delayed, delayed. But hopefully that will give some real impetus for us to embed the thinking around nature globally as well as within the UK. And I think the UK has a really important part to play here globally as well. Coming back to the research and what people valued, there was a really uh, striking point that the places that people go to see nature and get these benefits are their local parks, their local green space. Uh, the vast majority of people, when they go out to visit a place, it's that local space. It's not going off to the lakes or going out to the coast. Most people are just visiting their local park. They recognize the value of these places, but in terms of biodiversity, they see them as the lowest, lowest, uh, lowest value. That's a real shame and a real missed opportunity. Our urban green spaces can be incredibly valuable for biodiversity. They can be a key driving force for improving and restoring nature. And that people are seeing these as impoverished and poor quality, I think is uh, a real missed opportunity. And, uh, and also, it will undermine the benefits they're getting from those places if we don't look after them well, if we don't bring nature right into our cities. I think the last point I want to make is that um, I would echo the points about the Environment Bill. I think it's fantastic to see that coming through. But I would echo the points about the Office of Environmental Protection. It's vital, it's vital that that has strong powers, strong, clear remit. And the target that we've got, it is brilliant. We have had nature strategies and we have had targets for biodiversity for a long time now. I've been working on them for a very long time. This is the first time where they will be in law, which is really important. But that target, now I haven't seen the detail that's been drafted behind scenes at the moment, but that target at the moment isn't clear. And it needs to be, it needs to be crisp so that we're accountable for what's delivered there. The last point, sorry, I did say last point twice now, haven't I? <laughs> this is the last point. The, the, uh, the, the study showed that the, uh, the people we surveyed wanted Government and local authority take a really clear role in delivering this stuff. Businesses were put right down the bottom. I think that's a mistake. 
Not a mistake of all of those people. I think it's a mistake of us as businesses. So I'm sitting here as a business representative. We have an absolutely vital role to play in turning this around. The task force for, and I always get this acronym wrong, task force for nature-related financial disclosure, yeah, mirroring the carbon task force, is going to be crucial. The international target uh, for biodiversity at the moment has one for businesses, businesses disclosing their impacts. Businesses have a massive impact on nature, and we can turn it round. And if we really take the Das Gupta review to heart, as a sustainable business that we want to deliver in the long term prosperity for our clients, for our, uh, for our staff, we need to take nature seriously. We need to embed it in our thinking and understand the risks that, it, that undermining nature has to our business as well as the opportunities that enhancing nature provides. Thank you for my extra point. Thank you, Tom. Um, I do want to open up to questions, but I think I should um, give Rebecca a bit of a chance to come back on a few of those points. I think one that stood out for me, uh, first of all, the Office for Environmental Protection, will it have strong powers? Uh, strong, uh, Stanley is a bit suspicious uh, that they could be that it could be too weak as a body. My, is, is there any um, kind of thought process about around rejoining the European Environment Agency? Um, and, and, the well. and the target as well. I've just been, <laughs> just been whispered <laughs> in my ear. Um, the other thing as well, which I, I thought was an interesting point, um, I, I don't know if the government would at all be supportive of conservation clauses in a free trade agreement, but all of those things, I'll, I'll leave it up to you, Rebecca, what you want to come back on, because there's about 25 <laughs> different points made at you there. So. Oh, uh, so there were, Stanley. Yeah, like you took a great advantage of your platform to have a massive go at me. But I don't mind because Stanley's actually genuinely, as we know, he's a worldwide conservationist and uh, he's been nothing but supportive, really, in this journey. And I know that, like me, really, because my whole background is this as well, um, you know, we do want to get it right. And, and I think the, the, the good thing is we've got an opportunity, haven't we, to do this. And I'm going to take issue with Stanley uh, at the outset. And I know he did do amazing work in, uh, in Europe uh, on, the con on conservation and protections. But, but what I would say is it hasn't really worked, Stanley, because uh, we haven't protected our nature. We've got all these protections. And the EU that was just a constant system of litigation bogging everybody down. What we want and we now have the opportunity is to have a bespoke system here, um, you know, in, in the UK, in England, uh, so that we can protect uh, our nature in the way we think it should be protected. And that's why we've got this very detailed structure now set up through the Environment Bill. And we did, um, we, we got all our, um, you know, uh, protections any way that we used to have but remember of course we've also done a great deal more we've set um, our stall out saying that we're going to protect 30% of land and 30% of the sea um, he's omitted to mention this amazing target we've set ourselves and he omitted to mention we've got our marine protection areas which we are adding to all the time and we've got the new opportunity through the fishing bill a fishing act now to set our own bylaws now in in the sea so that we can tailor um, our own activities in in certain areas if we want to have more sustainable seas so we've got to look after our fishing industry but we have to have more sustainable seas so that's another really big part of this nature recovery issue and working on um, the higher m marine protection area review uh, we're now moving forward we've done a lot of consultation on are there big protections of the sea we can completely protect? You know, this is this is game-changing stuff we're doing, and it's really tough because, as you can imagine, not everyone thinks that's a great idea. Least of all our European partners, um, who all think they've got rights and so forth. So we have to tread through all these things with the trade deals as well, which I'm pleased you mentioned because yeah. all of that, you know, comes into play. But overall, we've got this massive commitment to restore nature, and just on the nitty-gritty of the wording, which Stanley was questioning me about so the wording is that um, uh, we, we, we have a duty to set a target to halt the decline in species abundance by 2030 that's the actual technicalities of the legal wording um, uh, and that's uh, that that's the commitment that's a commitment to recovering wider nature but we we've had to use this term species abundance but and I'm really happy Stanley to have more conversations about that because you can imagine the 
depth of the detail of the conversations we've gone into about this. And then, of course, within that, we'll, there, are all, there will be all the metrics on how do you measure it. I think Tom was saying that. And I'm really glad Tom went welcomes these targets because this is not something to be taken lightly. I mean, uh, getting that on the bill, uh, you know, in the bill, you know, this is this is a massive commitment, but we've got to deliver it. So that leads us on to how are we going to be held to account, which Stanley also touched on, and rightly so. Um, uh, the Office for Environment Protection has already been set up. It's in shadow form now, and then once the bills and um, properly through, and we're hopefully we'll get four percent before COP26. That's the aim. Uh, it will, you know, swing into motion properly. But um, we've got an, the wonderful Dame Venice Stacey heading it up, and she is not a woman one can mess about with. Um, and she, she is uh, strident on her, on the need to be independent, uh, and so forth. So uh, I'm confident that we've got a body there that will do that, and it will take public bodies uh, to to account. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry won't be able to go to them because they will be dealt with on the step by step system below that, because that's what's bogged. The European system down, and then um, we've got this opportunity, which Stanley knows about. This green paper he referred to, in which we are going to take a holistic view of everything to do with our protections, the way we um, we achieve um, success in, in in driving up nature recovery. Uh, but it's going to be a very, um, why well I say, engaged process. We want to hear from as many people as possible on what we think is right. We might decide what we've got already is the best system, but do you know what? We've got some real experts feeding in, um, but we want to hear from everyone on what is the best bespoke system for us now that we've got the EU. So I shall I leave it there because uh, we perfect. won't get on to any questions. Well, I want to, yeah, um, that's the thing. All. I do want to make sure that people <laughs> ask questions as well. We, we get oh, can those I just answers. say one other thing? Of though. One you other can. thing, of as you we can. had some and finalities and finalities. Um, <laughs> Uh, also, it's not just domestic, which I hope Stanley will be pleased about. And he should know that you know his own son, the Prime Minister, uh, has been right behind our signing the Leaders' Pledge for Nature, which is an international commitment to recovering nature. And and the G7 obviously made this nature restoration um, th th and said that they would reverse the decline. Um, it, and this is an international commitment. And that, too, is so, so important. Uh, and we have to... Uh, um, and that Lord Goldsmith very much works on the international front, and I'm the domestic minister, but obviously we link very, very closely together. Thank you. Great. Thank you so <laughs> much, Rebecca. That, no, that's Bill. Um, so, yeah, lots of questions from the floor. I do want to take some of these first. We, we are doing a kind of dual system, I should tell you, where um, at lovely Anvar at the back is sending me questions from um, s strangers on the internet. So we'll come to those in a minute, uh, which is very exciting. Um, but we'll do, we'll do some of these first. So a uh, lady in the... Um, in the lovely blue jacket there. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can't actually, I'm not sure it's on. Is check. it is it on the mic? I'm going to... Oh, we can yes, hear you. Yes, it is working. Excellent. My name's Susan Carey. I'm with Kent County Council, and I'm responsible for environment in Kent. And um, we're really up for this agenda, and we've been measuring our carbon emissions since 2005. We've been reducing them since 2005. In the last five years, we've reduced them by 43%. And biodiversity is, is part of the response, along with adaptation, that we're, we're going along. And I was so pleased to hear Rebecca Powell say she wants to, to get this right, because the way it's structured for the decarbonisation has been really, really difficult for everyone in local government involved within it because it's a system of everybody writing uh, proposals to bid for grants. So loads of effort going in up and down the country. And great if you win, as we have done at Kent County Council, major funding absolute nightmare when you get it though because the timescales are ridiculous given money in March having to accept it with an urgent decision I know uh, David Renard will understand the difficulties behind that we have to get it spent by the end of March yeah. next year and those sort of pressures are when you get things wrong so we've all got to do this biodiversity thing like we're all doing carbon reduction so here's an idea why don't you just give local authorities some grants and let them decide how to do best uh, in delivery? 
uh, rather than wasting all this effort in bidding. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Susan. We'll take one more as well, and then I'll come back to the panel. Um, this gentleman at the front. Thank you very much. Uh, Ian Bastable, um, executive member for um, Street Scene in Fareham. Um, it was really great presentation, uh, 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 and I was really in interested in what Tom had to say, uh, because the thoughts I had when you were all speaking was the reason why I hear on the door when I talk to people traction with climate change, you're very right, it really is up, up there, is because I think the general public can understand success and the definition of success when we're dealing with climate change. They understand what 1.5 degrees means, and they understand uh, actually grams of CO2 probably. Um, I think in, it, in, in addressing this problem, I think we need a currency for what the definition of done is so that we can really simplify what we all know is a complicated issue, and in fact, um, the minister pointed out it's actually a multi-dimensional issue, uh, simplify it down into a currency that we can explain to the public so that it's very easy to know when we're doing well and when we've met our target. So I wonder what the panel think. Can we develop a currency that makes it easy to do? And do we have any plans for the currency? I heard you mention species abundance. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be our currency? I, I don't like going on, <laughs> going on the door and saying it. But uh, so that, that's my thoughts on this. Do we have a currency that might be able to make it easy to understand? Thank you. Okay. Um, is there anyone that wants to pick up on that? Susan was talking about the pressures on local government. David, do you want to speak about that? Yeah, I'd absolutely. I, I guess it won't surprise uh, the panel to know that I'm going to agree with my local government colleagues uh, on the points they're making. Uh, in terms of Susan uh, around bidding, uh, I mean, it's not just this arena, of course, is it? It's. Uh, you know, we have to bid for everything, uh, whether it's roads or uh, road funding or whatever it is. And uh, I guess it's probably driven mainly by the Treasury, but Rebecca can uh, uh, confirm that or not. Uh, yeah. Um, but it is a real source of frustration. It takes up a huge amount of um, officer time to put in the bids. Uh, and I would love to see uh, a system uh, similar to the one that you described. But of course, uh, government will want to make sure that uh, we're delivering on whatever it is the, the government uh, mm -hmm. want to deliver. So, uh, yeah, I would agree. Uh, in terms of Ian's point around um, targets and making it clear to the public, y yes, this is difficult. Um, uh, in my own authority, uh, we've launched a campaign called Be The Change about, uh, as I touched on in my earlier remarks, we need to get the public involved um, and they need to understand that what they do contributes towards the, the change that we need to see. Um, so, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I, I do agree. We have to have a simple way of communicating this to our residents. Um, well, Rebecca, do you want to come back on particularly the local <coughs> government pressures? Um, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for your comments. And, uh, and I, I, I'm liaising very closely with local authorities because you're so important uh, in delivering uh, everything we're talking about with the. Um, uh, uh, David particularly talked about the waste and recycling initiatives, which I haven't even gone into. I mean, th th these are game-changing transformational measures which will set us on that much more sustainable path to a circular economy. You know, use less, uh, re re restore, repair, uh, and longer life cycles. You know, and it's very exciting, but the local authority is a huge part of it. And, um, you know, it w it, they will be fund you know, fully funded for the commitments that they've got to carry out. Um, I did, um, I mean, I was very interested to hear about your decarbonisation issues, and I'm um, not sure I should say this here, but, you, you know, speak to Michael Gove. <laughs> you know, he came from DEFRA, remember? So it's very much about understanding that wider picture, isn't it? And you, so you touched on, uh, on that so much about um, how you have to operate in your, your cycles of funding and so forth, which I fully understand, and we are taking into account and listening to you because we, you know, it will be the local authorities who will be the delivery, um, largely anyway, the delivery partners for the local nature recovery strategies, which are also coming down the tracks. Um, and I know a lot of you've probably done a lot already in Kent towards that. In Somerset, they have too. Um, you know, a lot of the work's been done on this. What I call it, it's like a map. It's like a fabric that you throw down over everything, and it shows you where there is good nature, where you need more, where you'd like your developmental housing and how you can integrate the two together. So I see it as very exciting, but working with local authorities would, will be absolutely key to that. Um, and uh, very quickly, of course, yeah, this is the sort of nub of it. It's not so easy to put this thing, I keep saying put a value on nature. We value it so much, don't we? 
But so we have to talk about things like species abundance metrics, huge amounts of work going on that. It's the same with soil. So we've got, and I work, I'm proud of this, it's a backbencher, I've got soil on the agenda. You know, it wasn't sexy. Nobody talked about <laughs> soil in Parliament. Sandy and I went there, but they're all talking about it now. And loads of people have come together on that agenda. And it's in there, in Elms, uh, in the new Elm system, you know, uh, and farmers will be paid to, to have good soil health and that also will affect biodiversity it affects all these things but equally measuring that is complicated and we've got lots of tests and trials going on on that Be you know because you can't just throw the money at the poor old farmer they've got to give you something you know so this is there's huge amounts of work going on this so that we know what's happening but the other thing is when you talk about nature i mean i think we'll all be able to tell won't we when you can start having to wash your car windscreen again <laughs> won't you because we mm. just haven't done that, have we? Yeah. So, so we sort of know inside, don't we? Uh, but in order to start putting payments on it, and there's work going on, obviously, on um, credit systems to be nitrate and phosphate neutrality. A um, lot of work going on on that with water companies in particular and other partners and business and developers um, so that they can basically do their offsetting. You know, for the phosphate one might produce from a development, because there's still phosphate in the water even after it's gone through treatment works. You know, how and they've got the nitrate issue. So, th this is a huge big space where we we are moving, but um, mm. treasury work in you know pound shilling and pence, and it has to be clear to them. So, so, so you touched on a very important point, um, mm. and and there's 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 work going on on it. But that's not stopping us introducing the nature recovery. We're getting on with it now. <coughs> okay, great. Um, I'm just going to take some uh, questions that have been sent to us um, from the internet. So I think that's that little camera up there. Hello, hello, people in other parts of the world. Um, th there's there's an interesting one here, which is quite specific, but I think we can widen it out a little, a little bit. From Jonathan, millions of people took up gardening during COVID. Can you give an update as to when the use of peat will finally be withdrawn and why has it taken so long? Um, another question from Rachel, how can we encourage more bottom-up action to protect nature? And I think there's a general issue there, which a couple of you have touched on already. Is COVID, can COVID be a game changer, a moment to reset, to rethink how we protect and engage with the natural environment? Um, anyone interested in talking about that? <laughs> Go on then. Well, peat is under my hat. So to speak, <laughs> um, and it's. I'm very pleased whoever sent that that Jonathan. message. Jonathan, Jonathan, thank you. I don't know where you are, um, but of course, peat um, is is one of our and peat land. You know what you call the typical habitat of peat is one of our very special habitats. But there's there's. I think we've got something like only 13 percent of uh, what you would call proper functional restored peat land left in this country, and we have upland peat like on the Peak District and so forth, mm -hmm. and we have lowland peat, such as on the Somerset Levels, where I come from, and over there in the east, which is our main agricultural growing area, and uh, that is blowing away, washing away. So we've got a huge um, project on to restore 35,000 hectares of peatland in this country, mm -hmm. and that's underway with a lot of uh, Jeffra grants. We've just opened our latest big funding round, going well, lots of big projects. But one of the things we've committed to do is, as Jonathan um, is referring to, mm -hmm. is to um, halt the use of peat altogether. Mm -hmm. Because I don't use peat in my garden. Um, I garden for wildlife and nature. And I've just done a wildflower meadow actually this summer for COP26. Um, but um, so we, and we've been working with the industry very, very closely. So we, we will be uh, banning the use of peat in horticulture um, I'm going to say aiming at 2024 um, and we've, we've really um, speeded this up. Mm. Uh, a lot of the horticultural trade has already stopped using peat altogether. There are lots and lots of alternatives. Uh, so if you go to the garden centre, please read the bag. Um, so comms is a very important part of it. Look at the, most people don't even know what peat does or why they're buying it or that's even in their growing medium that they've just bought in those yellow bags, Stanley. So, Stanley, I hope you don't buy it inadvertently or anyone else, because it's easy to buy it. So, so read the bag, but there's, there's, there's also huge amount of alternatives, but we're working with industry. That's the, the few small areas that still uh, need peat for one reason or another. A lot of scientific uh, data being gathered on this, and one is the mushroom industry. Mm. Uh, for, for 
for very specific reasons. So we, we uh, DEFRA funded, um, I think it was, a, well, it was, it was millions of pounds to do a lot of research on alternatives. They looked at 100 different alternatives. So they've got a lot of info now. And we're absolutely committed to A, um, phasing that out, and B, restoring the peatlands we've got. Mm. Because that's one of the biggest carbon sequesterers. If you can re-wet the peat, um, it not only does it stop releasing peat, but it also holds peat. Uh, holds uh, uh, carbon. It holds carbon, and there's work going on now. We set up the um, peat action task force, a uh, lowland peat task force, to look at how we can help those farmers o- over there, uh, particularly in the east and on some set levels, uh, to still have a living, uh, but um, to think of, of other forms of perhaps having wetter land on which to farm. Mm. Great. Very specific. You didn't realise there was so much to I didn't it, did know you? there was so much you were going to say about Pete, but <laughs> so I'm very pleased that you did. Um, can I um, bring you in, Tom, on, on the question from Rachel, which is a bit broader. How can we encourage more bottom-up action to protect nature? And also, can I add this question in from Oscar, because um, I think this, re- this relates very well to you. Are we doing enough to get businesses on board with the nature protection agenda? Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm going to answer the second question first, because I think it's, it's easier. Are we doing enough to get businesses on board? No. That's my answer. Great. Uh, but Short we, and sweet. Can, we can and should be doing much, much more. And I've mentioned very, very briefly the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosure. This is really important. And Target 15 within the draft of the Convention on Biological Diversity, getting very specific, says. So this is the, the, the uh, information that's going to be taken to the Biodiversity COP or the Nature COP, COP15, which is next year, um, uh, going to be held in China. The, the 15th target in there, it's draft at the moment, but it says that all businesses should be disclosing their impacts on nature, the risks to their businesses, and the benefits they're providing as well. They should be setting that out. Now, of course, there's a long road to go to getting from that international agreement to actually embedding that in law or in practice. But I think the faster we move on that, the better. And one of the things I think is the challenge to the Environment Bill is the timing. I think we really need it now. But we need to see what's coming out of that international convention and also allow that to inform how we embed legislation and policy within the UK. Now, I don't know how we do that. Maybe we can have some amendments following. I don't know. That may be very difficult, but some updates following the the bill becoming an act. But I think it's crucial that we respond positively to what's coming out of that uh, CBD um, and the the, uh, COP15, especially for businesses, because this is the first time business has been referenced and, and the reason I say that is not just because it's important to think about and we've got to save nature, but actually because if we don't, we'll be undermining our businesses. I strongly believe that the businesses that survive the 21st century and succeed will be taking nature and their dependency on it very seriously, as seriously as they take any other part of their supply chain. The second question is much more difficult, which is uh, how do we in- encourage bottom-up action well, I think there's some really positive signs. We saw a, it was described in the press as a weed garden, but a weed garden, a wildlife garden, winning awards recently. Um, we've seen uh, parks starting to leave areas of wildflower and, and managed really nicely so they don't just look sort of like something that's been forgotten. Um, and I think the more we can do that, the more we can make it part of our natural scenery in our parks in places on garden programs, in how we communicate about what we're doing, the more people will think, yes, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be part of. The other piece is that I've worked a lot with house builders, and there are lots of house builders that want to put in some really lovely features in amongst their gardens, whether it's holes for hedgehogs to move through, or uh, nice fruit trees uh, in and around the the, uh, development. And biodiversity net gain is going to be part of that story creating really nice places locally for people which will then encourage all of the people living in those places to start recognizing the value and looking after the biodiversity locally but i think it's it's a really tricky question um yeah thank you patrick (laughs) 
I just wanted to pick up on um, this gentleman at the front here's question around currency and also combine that with um, Jonathan's question around what can people do. Um, it's a really good question to raise because what we found when we were putting together this polling questionnaire with, um, with uh, Savanta Comrie as a polling company is that you have to really scale back a lot of the technical jargon that you use because people don't actually understand this stuff. Um, I mean, it's easy for us sitting on this panel who are plugged into this debate to talk about it and many or most of you in this room who take an interest in it, but most people um, that you would bump into on the street wouldn't actually know what biodiversity even means. Uh, so I think having a currency w that the public can understand and measure progress against is really important. As I said, when we designed the survey, we had to put definitions in front of questions so that people actually knew what policies were. I mean, people don't know what a biodiversity net gain principle is on a development of 10% lift. That, it doesn't make sense to people. So you do have to spell it out. And I think there is a case here for, um, for perhaps some further research uh, from behavioral scientists. Some of you may have heard of um, Professor Nick Chater, uh, who works on the Behavioral Insights team, who informs um, the government around how behavioural policy can help them to nudge consumers towards the, their aims. And one of his suggestions, and this relates in to decarbonisation, not so much to nature, but I think it, it's an interesting point, is to introduce a carbon pound. So what this is, it's not actually a, f a physical form of money. It's a representation of the carbon intensity of the products that consumers are buying. Because when consumers go to the supermarket, most people aren't aware of the carbon intensity of the products that they're buying, so it's actually very difficult for them to make informed choices. People care about climate change, they care about the natural environment. Our research and our survey is testimony to that. Um, but people need to be informed in an easy and simplistic manner so that when they go to the supermarket, they know which products have had a heavy impact on the natural environment and they know those that haven't. Um, we did do some polling around how the public would feel about a nature tax. Uh, we didn't use those words explicitly because as soon as you say tax, everyone sort of ducks for cover. But um, So we framed it as paying a premium for products that are harmful to the natural environment. Uh, admittedly, a majority of the public wasn't willing, but it was in the high 40s, so close. Um, so yeah, that's just my first point around. I think I do agree with you. I think the public need to be better informed about this stuff so that they can make informed choices. Uh, the second point around what can people do, I think that the government can support people to make better choices. Um, so for an example, the deposit return scheme, that's a, that's a brilliant example, making it easier for consumers to recycle their bottles or depending on how wide the scheme goes, uh, other items as well, uh, and then giving them a financial incentive um, for returning that. So I think those sorts of policies can be really helpful along with consumers being better informed, uh, but great point. Um, Stanley, I would like to pick up some of those points with you because we haven't heard from you for a while. You do also, you've just whispered in my ear that you want to say something about plastics. Um, but if you want to, as well, that's an interesting idea, wasn't it? The carbon pound, how do we get the public engaged? And if you, as well, if you, if you could potentially touch on has COVID changed people's attitudes, made people more focused on uh, the value of nature? Well, yeah, on, the, on this last point, we are moving in the direction of, of carbon border taxes because the EU is definitely going down that route, okay? Now, at the moment, the EU's proposal may be on specific, specific sectors, but there's no doubt that insofar as that proposal is going to work at all, there, there's going to have to be some metrics you know, to, to, to work out how the carbon border taxes are applied. The EU's concept is that countries which themselves have systems of carbon taxing which are effective would then be exempt from the carbon border tax. Now, I'm just moving on to this idea of nature, obviously, when we haven't even got the carbon border tax on the, on the agenda, although, as I say, the EU have, but there's no there's no commitment by the British government at this moment on this. Of course, it's a little bit ambitious to think, shall we also somehow manage to apply it to the biodiversity? I mean, you could, you could see, for example, that there are some products you would not want to have come into this country 
not so much because of their carbon impact, but because of their biodiversity impact. I mean, obviously, uh, wood products come from the Amazon do have a serious carbon implication because of the Amazon deforestation, etc. But they also have an important biodiversity implication. So I don't think we, don't think we're, we're, don't think we're done that route. And I've been thinking about it. And I'm thinking, well, maybe it would be better get, better to get a little bit further with the carbon border tax before we started talking about the biodiversity tax. Although I do think it's an extremely interesting idea. Now, if I could say just something else about, about plastics, we have um, we've had questions from the Kent County Council, and we're lucky enough to have Councillor David Renon with us. And I, I'm very conscious, you see, that actually I'm particularly conscious at this time of the morning, you know, because we've been a <laughs> right, a joke. Um, it's good, I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm very conscious that we have this huge volume of plastic still going to landfill, do you see? And, and a lot of that is single-use plastic. Now, in the good old days, um, councils, and, and David, do correct me if I'm wrong on this, in the good old days, the councils who couldn't do, do much with it, except dump it, shipped it off to China. And now, apparently, they can't ship it off to China, so they ship it to Turkey. But the, the point I'm getting at, and I re really wonder whether David could reply to this, the point I'm getting at, there must be a huge potential um, in, for councils to actually re rework some of these plastics, particularly the plastic, the plastic bottles, which they are getting. Y you're not necessarily going to create new plastic bottles, but I'm um, you know, supporting an organization called Upcycle, and Upcycle is pelletizing waste plastic. It's, got, it's getting plastic waste from the sea in, in, in Spain and so on, particularly you know, fishing ropes and God heaven knows what, pelletizing them and then making yarn from those substances and then actually, would you believe it, selling um, medical equipment back to, back to hospitals made out of the, the, the plastic yarn, which has got some important organic material, I think cotton linked to it. So the point I'm getting is, are we really, really doing what we can at council level to get rid of plastic to people who can, who can use it? Do you, you see, um, and, and, and actually do something, do something with it, because the, the op okay, Rebecca will talk to us about what's in the bill about plastics, and, 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 I'm, and I think I'm not up to speed. I think there's been a change in the law, has there not, yeah, about yeah. single-use plastics. Anyway. I think that's, that's such an interesting point. Can I wait to bring you two back in on it before? I just want to take a couple more questions, and then I think we'll go to um, closing remarks, and you can pick up on the things that have been put to you, um, the many things that have been put to you, Rebecca. And the <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> and um, Okay, so we'll have uh, this gentleman at the front. Would you mind giving Councillor Renard to answer something? Like that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, hi, yeah. Oh, hi there, thank you. Uh, Jim Clark from Zurich Insurance. Um, we recently signed up to the DEFRA Council Sustainable Business um, <laughs> Get Nature Positive campaign. Yeah. Um, what's the panel's um, view on tree planting for carbon offsetting? It's something that we do, something a lot of businesses do. I know there's a bit of a mixed sort of view of it from conservationists, so I'd be interested to know what people think about that and how can we make it better? Gentleman at the back here. Oh, thank you. Um, hi there, I'm Dylan, uh, work at the RSPB. Um, couple of questions I wanted to pick up on points made on the panel. One was for Rebecca. You said that um, you felt the bill was all the better for the time that had been spent on it. Just wondered if that means that those amendments made in the Lords are there to stay, um, if it's in a better state now than it was before. Um, and then I also just wanted to ask about the CSR um, and um, whether the panel have views on how uh, the Das Gupta review, for example, should be reflected in um, yeah, what we see at the CSR and yeah, Rebecca, if you could talk about maybe what the DEFRA bid into the CSR might look like on the back of that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Rebecca, do you want to come in on the, th the, the things that have been put to you? And, and we'll, we'll we've, only, we've only got sort of 10 minutes left, so if you want to okay. come here, you can kind of close it. This okay. is the wind-up. 
Uh, thank you so much. I mean, they're obviously, I think this demonstrates just how wide, you know, the whole remit is. That although we're talking about nature, of course, all these other things touch on it, including what we do with our waste, our recycling, and so forth. And um, thank you for who, well, it was Stanley that mentioned that. Stanley, there is a huge amount going on in this space. You raised some really interesting points about um, some, some, some great innovative projects that are being used indeed, aren't they? You know, all over the world. And um, we've got the single use plastic tax coming in. That's a, that's a treasury measure. Uh, I think I'm not. I think it's April, Meg. You can just confirm the date with everybody, okay? Because uh, uh, so then and then within, uh, w w which what's been coming through in the Environment Bill, and and actually was all um, set up through our Waste and Resources Strategy, uh, and some a lot of that was underway already, but a lot of the measures uh, mentioned in it have to come through in law through the Environment Bill. So through that, we've got our extended producer responsibility. Uh, and that is um, starting on plastic packaging because it is the most littered item, Stanley. And it is, um, you know, we, we don't want it to go to landfill. In fact, we set targets 10% to landfill by 2035, zero to landfill by 2050. But hopefully, you know, it could be a lot earlier. But the, the EPR, which uh, David will know all about, uh, I'm sure, and the councils have, you know, been liaising with them a lot of all, all this because it will cut down the overall amount of waste they have to deal with. So this puts the owner on the, say it's um, the person that made this. I hope this is <laughs> recycling, is it, and all that? Absolutely. Um, and it's, is that a single use plastic lead? Um, Am I in trouble? <laughs> <laughs> so um, the person who made that will have to think about where's this going to end up and they will be responsible for it. So they'll have to make sure the container they use uh, is recyclable or reusable. Okay, no. all of these things. When you get reporting, you need to just carry your own cup, and um, <laughs> and although it's so easy to lose them, and then you need a big handbag, it's very difficult. So I've tried it. Um, so they'll be responsible for that. What that will do, and where it ends up, and the cost of it, and all of that. So what that will do is make the people selling these products think about: Do they need a cup like that? You know, could they have a recyclable or reusable, and all of those. So that's the, the and they'll be responsible for the cost. That's the EPR. Then we can bring it onto a whole range of other products. But we're starting with plastic packaging. Mm. Then we got the deposit return. That too, Stanley. What will that that will do is uh, also. Uh, help reduce the amount of overall waste but what it will do it will do what manufacturers want they want good quality high quality uh, material to remake into bottles like coca-cola would love to make all of their bottles out of pet plastic but they simply can't get enough yet stanley yeah. so that's why we need all these measures and we need our great people at the council to do consistent collections which we're all in <laughs> consultation and discussion about now yeah. because we need to collect. We've got all these brilliant councils, but they all think they've got the best system and they're all slightly different. So if you want consistent materials, they've got to have pretty much the same uh, uh, you know, methods of collection, collection so that you end up with the right amount of products to, to turn back into things. So that's that, Stanley. So yeah. huge amount going on that. Uh, and we've got very strict controls on exporting plastic uh, now and the regulations uh, and we've got more inspectors and so forth and so forth. So, you know, we're not going to be dumping it all yeah. in Turkey. Okay. Uh, so very quickly, I did want to say tree planting. The interesting question. Who, tree planting? Here. Yeah. Um, fantastic that you joined the Council for Sustainable Business. Business. I attend a lot of their meetings. If you don't know about them, do do look them up. So this is a whole lot of our really forward-thinking businesses and they've produced a brilliant handbook uh, called Going Nature Positive for Your Business. So it's as well as the decarbonisation stuff. It's this other side of it that it's harder to explain, but it's the sexy soft bit we love. People love it, you know. Uh, and tree planting, yes, it does have great carbon sequestration um, properties, but so does the peat restoration, which is why the Nature for Climate Fund, which is £640 million, pounds, is, is devoted to those two things. So, and, but, the, but what I would say, it's not only about storing carbon, because if you plant trees, you get so many other benefits, mm. uh, which are, are holding water, storing water, um, uh, you know, insects live in the trees, and so all of that. And, um, and these nature-based solutions, which are these wide solutions for I incorporating nature, are so much part of how we allocate funding now and what lots of companies and businesses are now doing. Water companies, for example, with the wetlands to help clean water. 
bug control measures and things like that. If you will forgive me, I just want to talk about one other thing. Of course. Talk about how do we harness people in? It's what you were saying, Tom, you know, and, and various people in the audience have said. Because <coughs> it is, I think, much harder for people to put a, a statistic on it or tick a box, you know, for nature, even though we know we want it and we love it. And I face this myself. <coughs> so I, I, along with Zach Goldsmith, came up with this, the other side of climate change part of COP26, to get our hands in the soil, mm. hands on thing that people can do. So we've launched this initiative called Plant for Our Planet. Yeah. If you don't know about it, please look it up. Meg at, Meg at the back will give you the details. And it's to engage people because we can all do something. Mm. We can all plant something. It doesn't matter whether you've got a window box, an allotment, or you're in Walthamstow where I visited and they've got fantastic community schemes on every single street corner. They've uh, got a, a little veg patch that then people can buy and, buy and pick the strawberries. They've got a little community orchard outside the chapel. Every single space, they have put something, a mini meadow on a tiny little area, like a you know, four by four, uh, where they've got wildflowers. And they take pride in it, they look after it, they love it, and it's brought nature right into their community. So that's why I did my mini meadow at home. So I've got great pictures off if anyone wants them. So, that, so have a look at that. You can do anything. You can really do something. And people you know, can get embraced on this climate adaptation side. And there was a brilliant garden at Chelsea Flower Show that the RHS did. Did anybody visit it? The COP26 garden. Uh, and it showed you what you could plant uh, mm. to do your bit as well to combat climate change. <coughs> you know, have more resilient plants. Plants that don't need so much water. Uh, but they're all doing their bit, you know, to take in carbon dioxide and creatures will live in them and mm. there's so much you can do. Mm. Follow Perfect. me, follow me on Instagram, pow, pow, r <laughs> underscore of underscore nature and you will see all this stuff on it. Yeah, can you share that afterwards? Great. <laughs> it's not political, okay? Um, can I just go to David as well on the points that were made to you about councils and plastic? Yeah, please. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not aware that any councils are shipping plastics overseas now. Um, and <coughs> uh, certainly in my own authority, only about half a percent of uh, waste now goes into landfill. And I saw Susan put up a sign. I couldn't quite read it. Five percent in Kent. No, not even that. No. Actually, it's not Oh, well, OK. Brilliant. Yeah, so. And, and we have to buy Yeah. So local authorities are doing a, a lot on this, but of course plastics are complicated, isn't it? There? There's not just one sort of plastic, and uh, they all need treating in different ways. Um, and the, there's a, a Swindon-based company called Recycling Technologies who are doing a lot of work on um, returning plastics back to their original form so that they can then be turned into to new things. Mm. So <coughs> businesses are playing their part in terms of managing plastics. But <coughs> I agree with what uh, Rebecca said. You know, the the, the LGA position is <coughs> the polluter pays, and you know we need to get manufacturers. Uh, you know, we need to get back to source and make sure that manufacturers are producing either uh, plastics that are multi-use, not single-use, or if if they are single-use, that they can be recycled mm. uh, in some way by local authorities. And of course, uh, well, in, in Swindon, we're also looking at our collection systems uh, for the future you know I, I agree with you we need uh, it to be much more standardized uh, so that it w whatever is disposed of can be handled uh, 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 efficiently by local authorities mm. uh, and I'm sure uh, all other local authorities are going through a similar process at the moment to try and make sure that we're in a line uh, in alignment with uh, government legislation um, in terms of um, uh, well, good to see Jim from Zurich. Um, the <coughs> Zurich headquarters is in Swindon. Uh, we're just building a brand new headquarters there with Zurich. Um, it's hu hugely uh, energy efficient uh, building, or it will be when it's finished. Um, so uh, they're one of our great employers and uh, happy to be working with you in terms of um, planting trees. We're part of the, uh, the Green Queen's Green Canopy program. Uh, and Zurich are making an excellent contribution to that and w we, we certainly encourage that in my own authority and I'm sure uh, other, other councils around the country are also doing, doing the same. Um, I think the, the, the only other thing I wanted to mention was just coming back to something that was discussed right at the beginning mm. of today which was around um, enforcement. Mm. 
Uh, at the moment, there's quite a lot of, you know, people come to councils when things go wrong, and it's not necessarily the local authorities that have the, the powers to do that. So I think when this, the Environment Bill comes in, it does need to be really clear about who's responsible for what. Mm. Um, and at the moment, the Environment Agency and local authorities and, and, uh, and other agencies, you know, it's not really clear who's responsible for what at the moment. And I think we need real clarity around that when the bill comes through. Great. Perfect. Thank you so much, David. Um, I would like to hear some very brief, if possible, final thoughts uh, from people on the panel. So, Tom. Uh, I will keep it very, very brief. I think it's fantastic that we've had this uh, panel and, and fantastic that we've mm. had so many people. Christian. I thought there'd be three people here at this time in the morning on <laughs> Monday morning and uh, people on the internet as well. I would like to see this on the centre stage next time. Mm. I think yes. this needs to go up and up and up the agenda if we're really going to yeah. take this seriously. So thank you. thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Patrick? Um, I'll just very quickly come to uh, Jim's point around trees and then uh, deliver my brief closing remarks. Um, obviously, abatement at source is preferable, but um, I think that when there are some risks associated with um, tree planting, particularly around longevity, deforestation, uh, and also it's important that you plant the right trees in the right places and take into account how climate's going to change over time so that in 20, 30 years' time, those trees are still healthy. Um, Although it, it is true that um, there are wider benefits associated with tree planting, particularly around uh, reducing flood risk, which Rebecca alluded to. Um, I would like to see the Oxford Sustainable Offsetting Criteria embedded in a uh, company's offsetting policy, though. That is one thing I would say. And just quickly, my closing remarks, because I'm conscious of time. Um, just to wrap up, our report shows that people care about nature, they value it, they like conservation policy, and they want to see more nature in their communities. The Descripta Review is an excellent piece of theoretical work, but the challenge now is turning that into actionable policy. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, um, And Stanley, final thoughts from you. I can see that you've written Franco Manca on your <laughs> notepad. So I fear you are planning your dinner at the moment. But lunch. if you have any... Lunch. Lunch. <laughs> okay. If you have any final thoughts on this issue, we'd love to hear them. Well, I do have some, some, final, some final thoughts, and, and that is on this carbon offsetting thing. It's, of, of course, crucially linked to the negotiations relating to carbon to COP26, mm -hmm. because it's the, it's the Article 6 discussions. Uh, you, you know, you, you can have carbon offsetting, and, and, and that works. But if, if you're also trying to have international goals, you've got to have some sort of consistency internationally on, on, on who, who is recognizing what. So it's extremely, extremely important. And in that context, a little bit of, 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 of advertisement here, <coughs> If you if you look at your 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 program, this is as a, the shorter version of the program. This is the as a, the the official the official the, the, the big book is for the is for the fringe events. You will see that on um, Tuesday at ten minutes to four at sixteen fifty on the in the main in the main stage as it were, um, Alok Sharma, who is the president designate of of um, of COP twenty six will be talking, and actually he's talking to me, I he says here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he says in conversation with Stanley Johnson. Well, anyway, that's Can't the point, that. that's the point that's I want to get event. at, <laughs> is that there are some pretty key issues, you know, which uh, we might put to mm. Mr. Sharma, and, and I'm sure you'll take some questions from the floor, mm. and these are some of the things which might be worth asking him. Great. Yeah, unmissable. Thank you so much. Well, we have run out of time, um, but I just want to say thank you to the, the amazing expert uh, panel. It's been a really, really interesting discussion. I hope you've all enjoyed it um, as much as I have, and thank you all so much uh, for coming. I hope you have a great conference. Thank you.